Take off there. Uh, I mean, it's kind of easy to categorize it. Say it's, it's a courtroom drama and or a dark thriller. Uh, but your book, um, Elizabeth is Missing, I read it last August, I think, and I still can't find, you know, a genre for it. Can, can you help me? <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's a mystery novel. It's not crime yeah. in, a, in the usual way. It's not, there's no kind of massive revelation at the end, and it's, uh, there's not really a proper detective, but, um, but it's also not sort of literary. It's, it's not just kind of like... You're having troubles. Yeah, having, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> People keep calling it a dementia thriller, but that gives the idea that there might be car chases and things which there aren't. Okay, we're, we're getting we're getting close. But uh, I was thinking about like Bill's book um, Mission Flats because I mean he's most known for um, the Fatty Jacob, uh, which came out in Norwegian like last year I think. But then like his first book, um, and I want you, um, it's actually called in English Mission Flats and. It has the kind of like, I would say, strange and rather dull Norwegian title, that Ubehagle Sammeten, which is an inconvenient truth. That's a book by Al Gore about climate change. What is your inconvenient truth about? <laughs> uh, what is it about? It's about, uh, it's a, a detective story, uh, essentially. It's about a young uh, uh, policeman from a rural community who uh, is sort of drafted to be the. Uh, a police chief in his small town, even though he has no interest in being a policeman. So a lot of my books are about uh, young men uh, fitting in uh, in their uh, trying to deal with their what they've inherited from their uh, from their father. I have a lot of lost boys and and bad daddies. That's my <laughs> <laughs> that's my specialty. <laughs> now, and we were talking about it like earlier uh, about like this uh, concept called unreliable narration and. Uh, you know, because on the surface, you know, like your books, like this one and Defending Jacob, they seem to have some kind of like clear cut, either, you know, police procedural or legal thriller. But then there is something very different lurking underneath. And how do you like, how do you, how do you, how do you defy those genres every time? Well, I think that's sort of the, uh, for me, I don't, I wouldn't say this, uh, oh, did I just lose my mic? Um, I wouldn't say this uh, about other authors, but for me, it's just not interesting to write uh, purely genre books because we're, we come to this so late in the life of the genre. Um, as I churn through ideas for books when I'm between books, uh, I constantly think, oh, that idea is just like this, or that idea is just like that. Uh, and I want to feel that the book I'm writing is new and has never been done before. Uh, it's never true because it's all subjective and you can always find a book that's vaguely like what you're doing. Uh, it's impossible to do anything new at this point. Um, but I need to feel subjectively like uh, that I'm doing something absolutely original. Did you feel when you wrote, when you finished Elizabeth is Missing, did, did you feel that this is something new, this hasn't been done before? Uh, I don't think I really thought about it in that way. It just was the story I was writing and it was the one that I could not write. Um, I mean, I do know what you mean. It's, you don't want to feel that you're kind of going along the same lines. You want to feel that you're able to put this puzzle together yourself and it hasn't already been done. But I think, uh, for me, it was just this feeling that there was a story and there was a person that I was writing. Like, uh, Maud felt so real to me that I, I couldn't write anything else. So uh, I hadn't really considered whether it was like anyone else's. I mean, I deliberately didn't read anything about dementia, so there are lots of novel novels uh, with dementia in coming out around the time that I was kind of finishing editing, and I deliberately didn't read any of those because I didn't want to sort of accidentally take on tropes or you know, think that I had, I had come up with something clever and actually I had kind of accidentally stolen it. I wanted to be really, really careful that I didn't do that. So in that way, I was aware, I guess, that it wasn't entirely original. But... Um, but yeah, I, I was kind of... It might not even be so accidental. I mean, I, yeah. I steal all the time. Oh, right, right. I steal all the time, or I avoid reading things, not because I might accidentally steal something, but because I will absolutely steal <laughs> So when you're writing, you're so desperate for ideas to work in and, and that are clever, I, that if you see something good, you just grab it. Medium writers are inspired, good writers steal. That's right. That's yeah. exactly right. Exactly. That's exactly right. Uh, what, what were your first, what you call it, Detective heroes. Do you have like, any detectives or villains or things that, like when you were kids, teenagers? <laughs> uh, oh 
gosh. Uh, well, the, I really loved um, kind of 18th century Gothic uh, fiction. So in those, they don't really have proper detectives, but there's usually a young woman. She's always completely perfect, like the most moral person ever. And she is kind of navigating this world of evil people. And there's usually some kind of mystery. It's like a, a strange portrait of someone that then later is revealed that this is like some hidden wife or something. It's all these kinds of things. And she slowly, slowly, like... Uh, yeah, finds out what the cause of the misery is. Um, and there's things like, you know, a ghostly figure uh, who has been going to this tower for a long, long time and she and her sister are terrified and they think it's a ghost and it turns out it's her long-lost mother that's been uh, imprisoned by her father for the last 20 years. And it's that kind of thing. So I loved that. Um, Do you still read those? Uh, well, I read them all and now I, I, <laughs> now I kind of don't have any left, so... <laughs> Maybe I'll go back. Maybe again. What did you grow up with? Uh, uh, I don't know that I had detective heroes. I still don't really read uh, detective or crime fiction all that often. Mm -hmm. uh, if I were forced to think of detec detectives, it would probably be movies mm -hmm. uh, more than books. I, I love Chinatown. I still love Chinatown. Um, so I think that that uh, was really more of a, a focus. I read widely, but not in... Uh, uh, Crime or but, detective stuff so much. But Bill, you're from Massachusetts, right? So, uh, what's the great Boston movie you want to recommend? Uh, the, we were talking earlier about uh, the Friends of Eddie Coyle, which is a. Uh, oh, I don't geez. know if you know this movie. It's uh, and, and this book. The book is great. It uh, it was written by a guy named George V. Higgins, who uh, who was a prosecutor in Boston, as I was. He was a lawyer, uh, and he wrote this uh, book that's very. Uh, very hard boiled and was told uh, mostly in dialogue and it was told from the bottom up. It's about these criminal lowlifes. Uh, there's no brilliant detectives, there's no brilliant criminals. Uh, it's a bunch of losers uh, and the idea of telling a story about these people who were of no significance at all uh, was great. Was great, and they made a terrific movie out of it with Robert Mitchum, uh, who's in it. Peter Boyle is also in it. It might be Peter Boyle's first movie or second movie. Um, and the book, and and the book is like it's like 150 pages. It's very and short. They're all, they're all they're all tiny, you know. But what about like wasn't this James Gandolfini's his last movie? Wasn't that like some adaption of a uh, George V. Higgins? I didn't novel? see that one. I didn't What's see the it. name of that Oscar? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, but I remember the, the final words of James Gandolfini uh, were written by Dennis Lehane because he wrote the mm -hmm. script for the last movie uh, by James yeah. Gandolfini, which is also which is that's also. Oh, that's right. You know, now that you mention it, it, it was actually a Dennis Lehane story mm. uh, that that movie was based on. No. And it was called The Drop. No. I, think, no. I think. I think. I think you need well, to you know, this. like this is the only time in history, right, when like modern people yeah, who we have IMDb no internet available. Yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> no, there's no internet. If somebody can Google the final <laughs> movie of James Gandolfini, we'll, we'll get back to that. That's right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He's some kind of like assassin or hitman or something. It is Dennis Lane hmm. because we actually wrote a post about it on our blog. The final mm -hmm. words of James Gandolfini is written by Dennis Lehane. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. okay. <laughs> but well, I, I emailed a little bit with your agent, uh, Emma, uh, but when we invited you guys to come here, and your agent said, because you are not a Boston hard-boiled crime reader, according to your agent, uh, this sounds great. Emma's taste lies more in classic cozy crime. Sherlock Holmes, Poirot, um, and old Paul Temple mysteries. Is, is this an accurate description of uh, your taste? Uh, I guess so. I mean, I like a lot of different things. I, um, I discovered George Pelicanus uh, last year, and I thought he was really brilliant. Mm. Um, uh, and I loved uh, Raymond Chandler. I mean, you know, I think he's absolutely wonderful. I love, you know, all his turn of phrase. The stories I sometimes get quite lost. Um, which I think is quite common, <laughs> um, but I, you know, I love those. Yeah, I mean, I, I listen to a lot of uh, crime on the radio. Um, the BBC do a lot of adaptations of uh, crime stories, and they're really, really good. Uh, so yeah, I guess I, I guess cozy crime. I always worry about that. Like, what does that mean? Like, there's a kind of cozy murder. I just what? I find that odd. Yeah. <laughs> cozy crime. Yeah, it's yeah. Uh, but, but but did you grow up with with like Agatha Christie, Sherlock Holmes, 
uh, of the gondola. Was, was that something you discovered at the same time when you were reading the, like the, the Gothic? Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, well, Sherlock Holmes is something that um, we kind of looked at at school. They were quite often, uh, they would set up something where you would you'd read the beginning of a Sherlock Holmes mystery and then you'd have to finish it off yourself. Um, and I always <laughs> cheated and just read the story, <laughs> which you were not supposed to do, obviously. Uh, so I remember the, the um, Napoleon's one, the, the Napoleon busts one, and you were supposed to work out a solution yourself. And of course I didn't, I just read it and rewrote it effectively, and then pretended that I was just very clever. Um, so yeah, I guess it was something I grew up with. You cheated at school. Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> Like, now, now the prosecutor is here. Yeah, let's contact this teacher. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, I have a feeling she probably knew. No, that's a bit. Yeah, yeah if you were yeah. guessing the right yeah. answer every time. Yeah. Well, what would you think about the new uh, adaption of Sherlock Holmes, the, like the modern version, the, the series? Yeah, this might be controversial, but I hate it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I well, really, why is that? I just think it's over the top. I think, like, when you really read Sherlock Holmes, he's not meant to be, like, a sociopath. He's not meant to be, like, totally unfeeling. And there are loads of moments in the book when he is really feeling. But the way that he's been written and portrayed on the, the new TV series, he's, like, got no emotion. Um, and they, make, they almost play that for laughs, and I just find that... Uh, inaccurate and irritating. He's like a superhero. You don't get any of the good stuff. The good stuff about Sherlock Holmes is the moment when he explains his method. But the new TV series is just like, I've got the answer. And you don't, you don't get the explanation. You just get the, like, some random crap in there. Sorry, Joe Swerve. But some stuff on the screen that's like, like text messages and stuff. That's not Sherlock Holmes. It's not cozy enough? Or? No, it's not clever enough. No. It seems like they cut out the bit the clever bit where they show you his method where where you go, oh wow, that really is someone being brilliant and they just have like, a, it's almost like he's a mind reader instead, which I just think doesn't work. But it is refreshing to meet the first person in the universe who doesn't love the new Sherlock Holmes uh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. It is refreshing. Uh, but, but one thing I was wondering about, because of movie adaptions, I guess movie rights for both of your books have been sold or... TV rights for me. TV rights for Elizabeth Smithing and Defending uh, Jacob. Yeah, movie. Movie. Uh, like Ridley Scott, John Frankenheimer. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it, it's a guy named Steve Cloves who uh, is actually, has actually been a screenwriter for a long time. He did most of the Harry Potter movies. Uh, but he, way back when, his first movie out of the box, which he uh, wrote and directed, was The Fabulous Baker Boys, which I don't know if you remember, but was a great movie. And then he sort of got away from directing. He had a movie after that, uh, and then after that he stopped directing. And this uh, will be his uh, return to directing. So that, uh, normally I say that, uh, that filmmaking is such a shot in the dark that you should never count on it, because uh, these, these deals fall through all the time. But the fact that this is his baby and this is his return to directing instead of just a screenplay gives me a smidgen of hope, but not much because it's... It's still Hollywood. It's still Hollywood, and these things fall through all the time. But it's, it's great that, that there's at least a, a director attached. That who, who do, who do you odds. want to play your characters? Who do you want to play Maud, if you could just, like, pick? <laughs> and who do, you, who do you want to play Andy? Oh, my. <laughs> it's a difficult one because you have such a definite idea of them in your head. So people keep saying Judy Dench or uh, Anne Reed or Maggie Smith. I mean, there are so many older women actresses who would be fantastic. Uh, there's kind of, yeah, too much choice, really. Judy Dench? <laughs> I love Judy Dench. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, uh, I don't have a clear picture. I don't, um, when I think, I'm writing, I, I may, don't have Maybe a, a Baldwin brother? <laughs> Any Baldwin brother, yeah. Uh, anyone who happens to be named Baldwin. Um, I don't. Uh, I don't know. I don't. When I'm writing, I don't have a clear picture. In fact, I, I feel that it's important to uh, not have a clear vision of your character. And I hate in books where you'll be reading along and. And they'll say, oh, he looked just like George Clooney. Uh, and it doesn't leave the reader any room to create that character for herself as you're reading along. Uh, and I, as a writer, too, I don't have a, a, a clear vision of what the character looks like. So I don't, I don't have a particular person in mind. I think the problem for, for this story is it, the, the character is a lawyer whose son 
uh, is accused of a murder, uh, and his, uh, this lawyer's father also was a convicted murderer. So he's the son and father of a murderer, though he's a very uh, straight arrow sort of person, a very law-abiding person, very disciplined person. So it would have to be somebody who can project intelligence, but who could also project that he might actually be the son of a murderer too. So he'd have to have a, a physical strength as well. So it would have to be somebody like that. It sounds like Matt Damon because it's yeah. a Boston yeah. connection too. So. No, exactly. And um, I mean, we were talking a lot about Gone Girl when we were sitting down like earlier. And uh, I mean, Ben Affleck, he is certainly someone who's always you know, mm -hmm. affiliated with uh, yeah, Boston Lewis. Uh, what do you what do you think about uh, the town, for example? That's an eternal favorite of ours, you know, the blog. We like the I love the town. I thought it was great. I thought he's. I, I, I think I think he's actually a better director than an actor, and I think that that movie uh, was was great. Was well, great. Yeah. But what I liked about him in uh, in Gone Girl is the fact that you know he he it does look like some kind of like not too ambitious dude moving back Swagger. to the Midwest, yeah. you know, it's like, it's, it's because he can be so handsome and so, you know, like movie starish, you know, but there, right. he's not, I mean, he, he looks like someone who's just like, yeah, who, who got fired from some second-rated magazine in New York and moved right. back to his parents' hometown.